Well, good morning and welcome to another teaching. It is a Sunday morning here in Texas and uh, we're in the Advent season and thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I mean, it's uh, it's a good time. We're in the month of December and hopefully you've been uh, just, just walking out this Advent season and really reflecting on Jesus, reflecting on his birth, reflecting on you know, the ramifications on really what it means and the overwhelming just, you know, just uh, just substance and fullness of what it means that that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that our God, God, the son, the son of God entered this world for us, his advent. Remember, advent means coming right or arrival and just uh you know, what it means that, that Jesus did come 2,000 years ago, entered this world willingly as a human man, uh, lived a perfect, righteous, sinless life on our behalf that we could never live, died a torturous death on the cross that we should have died and has been raised from the dead. So thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay, so the first three teachings on the series um, we're dealing with the advent and Jesus's first coming, right? The, the realities of, of his first coming and, and, you know, and, and all that that means and, and just reflecting on that and studying the scriptures on that. And so now this teaching and the next teaching are going to deal with the, the second advent, so to speak, or dealing with the advent and what will happen at his second coming, right? Uh, his first coming, the advent that happened, we reflect back on what happened 2000 years ago when Jesus came. And now in this teaching and the next teaching, we're gonna read the scriptures and study and, and talk about what it means that, that he is coming again, right? As part of the Advent season, we wanna meditate on the fact that Jesus will return. We wanna reflect and think about what happened at his first coming and, and what the Bible now says, what he said and what the other scriptural authors said about the reality that he will come again. And, uh, and remember, he came the first time as a suffering servant. Uh, the next time he comes, when he comes again, and if it was up to me, it'll happen before this teaching ends. But when he comes again, he will indeed come as a conquering king. Wow. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. All right. Well, Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your mercy, your your favor, your goodness, your grace, your wonder, your love, Father. We thank you for Christmas, Lord. Um, we just thank you for this Advent season, Father. And more than anything, Father, as we always say, above all, we just thank you for Jesus, our only Lord and Savior and Master and King. Lord Jesus, we worship you. We thank you for becoming a human man for us. We thank you for living a perfect, righteous life on our behalf that we could never live. We thank you for dying a torturous death on our behalf that we should have died. And we thank you that you're alive and risen and we do worship you today. We worship you today, our risen Savior. Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us and guide us now as we open your word. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Okay, so... As part, again, this Advent teaching, now we're going to discuss and we're going to be reading some scriptures, and we may have probably a half dozen scriptures today we're going to read that are discussing when Jesus will come again, right? His second coming, the return of Christ, right? A second Advent, so to speak. So let's start with Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31. Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Wow. All right. So again, Matthew 24, 30 and 31, right? You hear the scripture. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. 
and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Wow. Okay. So again, we're going to be talking about these scriptures, but let's look at uh, Matthew 24 now. Matthew 24, and we're going to read verses 36 to 44. Matthew 24, 36 to 44. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Okay, wow. So there it is. Jesus is coming. He can come at any time. Again, there, there ought to be a desire in our hearts for him to come, right? I mean, the, the, the Bible ends, right, with, with saying, amen, come Lord Jesus, right? Look at Revelation 22, verse 20. Revelation 22, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. So those are Jesus's words. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Jesus said he's coming again. And then the Apostle John ends the Bible by saying, amen, come Lord Jesus. So what we want to do is when we read these scriptures, we want to to meditate, number one, on the reality that certainly Jesus has come and all that that means, but but he is coming, right? He's coming again. all those who are believers will be will be gathered to him, and there will be judgment. And we're going to talk about the importance of that in the next teaching, Lord willing. We're going to talk about that that one of the great realities of the second coming of Jesus is that all of us will face judgment. Right? There'll be judgment for every believer. We'll go before the judgment seat of Christ, and we'll discuss that. And every unbeliever. We'll go before the great white throne judgment, Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15. Um, No one will have the same reward in heaven for all those who had genuinely received Christ. For those who were true and genuine Christians, they were saved. We'll go before Jesus and, you know, based on how we lived our life and used our time, our gifts and talents and our money in his service, you know, we'll, we'll be rewarded accordingly. So we don't get to heaven by anything we do, excuse me, but our reward in heaven will be based entirely on what we've done and how we serve Jesus. Those who are not Christians will go before the great white throne judgment, every single person who did not know Christ, and they'll be judged on their works. No one will make heaven, and every one of them will be assigned a place in hell uh, a punishment in hell for all eternity, depending on the level of evil they lived in. So no one has the same reward in heaven, all those who are true Christians and saved, and no one will have the same punishment in hell. So, all right, look at uh, look at Revelation 1, verses 7 and 8. Last book of the Bible, Revelation 1, 7 and 8. Jesus speaking, Behold, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. And here's Jesus. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was 
and who is to come, the Almighty. Wow. So again, Jesus is indeed our God. He's the Son of God, God the Son. Remember, we have a triune God, one being, three distinct individuals, separate persons. God the Father, God the Son Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. And in Jesus Christ, for those of us who have received Jesus, we've received eternal life in Jesus. We're trusting in Jesus. We're believing in and on Jesus alone for the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our soul. In Jesus, we, we have relationship with each member of the triune God. God the Father is our heavenly Father. God the Son, Jesus, is our Lord and Savior and Master and King and, and friend and, and, and husband. We're the bride of Christ. And uh, God, the Holy Spirit, is our guide, our counselor, and our comforter. Wow. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right. Look at Titus 2, verses 11 to 14. Titus 2, 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Wow. So in these verses, again, that's Titus 2, 11 to 14. You see both. You see the advent here and the first advent and the second advent. And you see that in, in these verses. And again, we're going to talk about these verses. Mm. Excuse me. I got my, uh, my, my McDonald's coffee here. You know, Stephen was was off put. He thinks that the McDonald's cup is an eyesore. So forgive me for those watching on YouTube if <clears throat> if you find that disagreeable. Um, thank you, Lord Jesus. Man, these Titus verses, all right? So I'm going to read a couple others and we're going to come back to these Titus. Matter of fact, no, let's do it now. So I want to say it again. Titus 2, 11 to 14. You see Jesus' first coming in here and you see his second coming. You see the fullness of the advent. Again, remember, advent means arrival, right? It means coming. Titus 2, 11 to 14, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, okay? That appeared in the first advent, okay? For the grace of God has appeared. It's grace. Uh, God's grace is his unmerited favor to us. We don't, we don't deserve it. We actually deserve wrath. We deserve punishment. We deserve death. We deserve hell in ourselves, I know that sounds harsh. That's the plain teaching of the scriptures. Um, and, and again, the reason it sounds harsh to us is because we don't, we don't understand. From a human perspective, it's very difficult to understand how sinful sin really is. How bad, how wicked our sin really is before a, a holy God, right? Titus 2, 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, okay? So 2,000 years ago, the grace of God appeared in the form of the God-man, God the Son, Jesus Christ, entered the world, bringing salvation for all people, okay? So all people all over the world, salvation is available to you in Jesus Christ our Lord. Salvation, we need to be rescued, we need to be rescued from the wrath of God the Father and an eternity in hell, right? We need the forgiveness of our sins, the salvation of our soul. We need spiritual life. We need eternal life. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. This happened 2,000 years ago, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Now, you know, Titus, uh, Paul is giving, giving us and writing Titus, you know, what, it, what the purpose of it is, right? So, our salvation is certainly for our forgiveness, certainly so we'll have relationship with the triune God, certainly so we could be delivered from eternal hell and the wrath of God the Father, and certainly so we so we can go to heaven. But, I mean, it, it's it, it, the main reason that, that we're saved, all that's wonderful, and obviously we need that, but it's so that we'll live for Jesus more, so that we'll grow to know him more. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions 
and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Now look here, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right. So there it is. There you see, waiting for the blessed hope. We're waiting on the advent, the second advent, the second coming of Jesus, the return of Jesus, right? And then listen, he's going he's gonna to mention the first advent here again. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us back at the first coming, right? The first advent, who gave himself for us. Why? To redeem us from all lawlessness, all sin, right? Sin is at its beginning lawlessness, meaning sin is breaking the law. It's breaking the written law and it's breaking the moral law of our heavenly father, right? Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So again, um, Again, our salvation has nothing to do with anything we've done, but trusting and relying and clinging entirely to Jesus and what he's done on our behalf and in our place. But now the result of that ought to be a people for his own possession, Jesus, right? He owns us, he bought us, he paid for us, who are zealous for good works. And again, as we as we meditate and think about and think about his coming. And again, we'll get into this in the next teaching, Lord willing. But we 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 want to understand that we need to be zealous for good works. We want we we want to to love him in light of all that he's done for us in in the advent and his first coming and what he did 2000 years ago is it's really incomprehensible. Our our entire life ought to be growing increasingly zealous to do good works, and also to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age before he comes, right? Um, so again, those verses, Titus 2, 11 to 14, you see three mentions, two mentions of the advent that we're celebrating at Christmas when he came 2,000 years ago, and then one where he says, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior. And there it is. Jesus is our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and again, a reference to, you know, his uh, His second coming and his return. All right. Let's look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Paul tells the Thessalonians, it's the word of God. He's telling us, for the Lord himself... He's talking about Jesus. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And again, we're, we're waiting on this. Again, it was up to me. Jesus would come today, right? So again, profound scriptures. Again, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Let that sink in. With the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord always. So, again, this is talking about when Jesus returns. Um, again, we're going to be with him. Um, and, you know, all those who have died in Jesus before his second coming, they're already alive. Okay. Um, when we die, immediately, okay, immediately, there is no time where we're just unaware. There is no long time of unconsciousness. Our consciousness will go from this life into eternity, either in the presence of Jesus, if we're saved, right, in heaven, or if we're not in hell. Um, but there is no, quote, soul sleep, right? There's no time that when we die, we're just out of it, and then one day we just pop and wake up. Um, you know, to be absent from the body 
is to be is to be present with the Lord, right? You remember what Paul said in Philippians um, chapter one. Like, matter of fact, we can turn there because Paul said he would rather die because at his death he gets to go and immediately be with Christ, and he says that's better by far, but it's more necessary for the Philippians that he remain. And convinced of this, he believes that he will remain, right? Um, so look at uh, Philippians 1, 21 to, uh, to 24. Philippians 1, 21 to 24, Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. 25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your joy, for your progress and joy in the faith. So you see there uh, that he says in verse uh, 23, I am torn between the two. And he's talking about between staying on this earth, staying in this life, and living and serving Christ. Paul says, I'm torn. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. His desire is to die. His desire is to leave this life because then he gets to be with Jesus. This is this should be the goal. This should be the absolute goal of every one of our faith. Very few of us could say this. Um, we may have moments. I may have moments. But but look I, again. Paul says I'm torn, right? Because he's he's he has no connect. This world has no hold over him. He's here to serve Jesus, as he as he made clear, right? I, I am torn between the two, living and dying. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. So there it is. Paul knows that the moment he dies, the moment he closes his eyes in death, he'll immediately be taken into the presence of Jesus. And, 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 and that will be, and he says it's better by far. It's better by far, 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 far than living in this life, right? We get to be with Jesus. And that ought to be the goal of all of our lives. Obviously, our lives belong to Jesus. We need to live out our lives until he returns, right? The second advent or, or you know, or takes us home in our death, right? The point is that when we close our eyes, immediately we're brought into eternity, we're fully conscious. We're fully aware. Um, we will get uh, a resurrected body, an eternal body um, that we'll have for all eternity. For those in Christ in heaven, for those who did not have Jesus, we'll have one and, and spend eternity in hell. Have mercy, Lord Jesus. Wow. Mm. All right. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right. Let's look at uh, Philippians Three verses 20 and 21. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So we just spoke about how the scripture says that, you know, we'll get a heavenly body. Here it is, Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Okay, Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior. We're awaiting now our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. When he comes, Paul says, who will transform our lowly body, that's this, this earthly body, to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So again, um, at the, at the coming of Jesus, we will all get an immortal body. That's, that's fitting for our eternity. Again. So when you think about all these things, when you think about the coming of Jesus Christ, I mean, what comes to mind? The first thing that ought to come to mind is, do I know, 
Am I certain that I'm in Jesus Christ today? Am I certain that I believe what the Bible t- teaches about Jesus? Am I, a, am I a genuine Christian? Am I trusting and relying on Jesus alone for the forgiveness of my sins, the salvation of my soul, deliverance from wrath of God, deliverance from eternal hell, and to bring me to heaven when I die? Am I, am I relying on Jesus alone for my spiritual life, for my eternal life? Wow. Isn't that good that our citizenship is in heaven, right? And the only reason it's in heaven is that we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself, it says, who will transform our lowly body, our earthly body, to be like his glorious body, right? I mean, it's it almost seems too good to be true, right? We'll get a, a heavenly body, an immortal body, a body that doesn't get sick, a body that doesn't die, a body that doesn't need to go to the bathroom. Doesn't that sound cool, right? No waste in heaven. Your, your immortal body, you'll eat. The Bible says we'll eat when we're in heaven, but it, it won't create waste, right? You won't have to go to the bathroom in heaven. Um, you know, it's, it's glorious. All right. Look at uh, a couple more scriptures here. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when we do communion, right? When we do the sacrament of communion and we take the bread and we take the wine, um, Paul says, for often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, whenever you're doing communion, what are you doing? You're proclaiming the Lord's death his first coming, his first advent, until he comes, until until he comes again in the second advent. Wow. All right, and then looks, let's look at uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Acts 1, 10 and 11, and we'll end up here. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So this is in the book of Acts. It's in chapter one. Jesus has given them final instructions and exhortations. Um, And then he's taken up, right? He he ascends to heaven. This is the end of, of his First advent of his first coming, um, 40 days, uh, he walked the earth, right, Um, after his resurrection from the dead, and then he was taken up right before them, right? He ascended back into heaven um, right before them, and, you know, the, the apostles are looking into heaven as they saw him just get taken up, and again it says, and while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So again, we have this promise of the second coming of Jesus. It's kind of a, you know, it's an interesting scripture because it's written as if, you know, the angels appear to the apostles and say, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? Oh, I don't know, because I just saw Jesus like go taken up and float right into the sky, through the clouds, up into up into heaven. So yes, why am I staring? And what they're saying is, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So as sure as Jesus Christ came in, in the advent, right? This Christmas season, we're celebrating We're celebrating Advent, right? The arrival of Jesus. Um, We need to meditate and consider and think about and reflect that Jesus is coming again, right? The Advent will happen again, the second Advent, so to speak. He will return and he will come again. We will get to be with him, right? We'll get new bodies. And and as we're going to talk about uh, next time, the 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 massive ramification of his second coming is that we will stand before him and give an account of our lives. There will be a judgment um, 
And again, that's something we want to reflect on because that ought to drive each one of us to, to walk with Jesus more intentionally, right? Um, knowing that we're going to stand before him, right? The more we love him, the more we want to please him, the more we want to serve him. Wow. Well, Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your mercy, your favor, your goodness on our lives. Lord, we thank you for our Bible. We thank you for these incredible scriptures that promise the return of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming 2,000 years ago. We thank you, Lord, for humbling yourself and coming and, and suffering for us and living for us and dying for us. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are alive and risen and that you will come again, but this time in power and glory and righteousness to rule on earth, even as it is in heaven. Holy Spirit, we ask you to seal this to our hearts now. Give us eyes that see Jesus, ears to hear him, hearts to know him better. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen and amen.